then you certainly don't want to uh, want to sound uh, like um, uh, you're maybe bragging at the expense of other jurisdictions, because we certainly don't wish any ill will on, on any of our neighbors and any other provinces. But it is something, I think, for British Columbians to be proud of. Uh, you know, that, that, that we, are, we, are, we do have the strongest and the top-ranked uh, economy uh, in the country. Um, we're the bright spot in Canada. We're growing at, at, at roughly double the, um, the national average. Uh, we're expected to lead the country in economic growth, not just this year, not just the year after, uh, but the year after that. Isn't it ironic? The very cost of the latest increase to medical services tax will bring in about $100 million this year, and that's exactly the amount that's going to be used to establish the so-called Prosperity Fund. Begs the question, prosperity for who? Certainly not the hard-working taxpayers in this province who are tired of being gouged by this government, whether it's MSP or BC Hydro or ICBC or more costs for services, like kids. Nowadays, kids have to bring reams of paper, stacks of paper to school as part of their school supplies. When did that ever happen in the past? Never. The ability to continue to invest record amounts in infrastructure uh, is because we, uh, we continue to, uh, to grow our economy. Um, the economy is not just strong, uh, it's not just growing, but it's also diverse. And, uh, and, and again, that has somewhat, uh, 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 somewhat um, sheltered the province from the, the strong headwinds that we're seeing uh, in economies in the rest of Canada and, and elsewhere in the world. And what about debt-free BC? How's that working for people? We have the largest debt ever in the history of this province under this Premier's watch. Uh, we're going uh, we're gonna to balance our budget for a fourth consecutive year, Honourable Speaker. Uh, we, we will continue to be the most competitive jurisdiction uh, in the country from a, tax, uh, a taxes perspective. Uh, we're poised to eliminate our operating debt uh, uh, for the first time in decades. Uh, we uh, we uh, uh, have had our AAA credit rating uh, continually uh, reaffirmed. This government would have to accumulate $7.7 .7 billion of operating surpluses every year for the next four years to eliminate it by 2020. Not very likely. Not very likely, Madam Speaker. That's what leadership is all about, the ability to uh, invest in uh, our social programs, the ability to invest in more in education and more in health care, the ability to invest in the infrastructure that a strong economy needs to move forward, um, uh, the ability to do all of that re must rest first and foremost on the foundation of a strong uh, economic uh, fundamentals. Um, Mr. Speaker, we're in a pretty unique club when it comes to balanced budgets in, in, uh, in Canada. In fact, it's likely we will be the only jurisdiction in this country with a balanced budget. Now, the others can argue about that and suggest that's not important, but there's some pretty significant reasons we want to make sure we have a balanced budget. And, and Mr. Speaker, we're going to work to make sure that it's not just four in a row. We're going to make sure that it's five in a row. Um, Mr. Speaker, as we look at, at how that's possible, um, we, we look at the kinds of things and, and why it matters, Mr. Speaker, is because that's how eventually you get to enhance programs. That's how you get to make sure we have the best... Uh... Mr. Speaker, that's uh, exactly how we get to make sure we have top-level funding in education, whether it's health care, our outcomes are the best in the world. There's, there's many things um, that uh, this government is doing, and, and the reason why we can do a lot of that, Mr. Speaker, is because we've got the AAA rating. That's because we've got a balanced budget and we're spending within our means. BC's total debt has gone up by $9 billion since this Premier used the term debt-free BC in the 2013 throne speech, from $55.8 billion as of March 31, 2013, to $64.8 billion by the end of this fiscal year alone. The latest fiscal projections show total debt continuing to increase each year, reaching $69 billion by 2018. Well, that's quite a legacy to be proud of for our children and grandchildren. If, you know, I've heard various uh, um, figures um, um, reported about uh, the, the amount of money that we have available to us. If, if we had the same credit rating as some of the other provinces, 
we'd be spending billions of dollars more on interest uh, on, on the money that the province owes. But as a result of that, we can put that, those billions of dollars now into social programs, into public safety, and making our roads safer, and making our community safer for everybody that we have. So keeping jobs and communities in forestry is important, and it's not happening in this under this government. We want to see BC logs for BC jobs. That would be a visionary statement. In mining, uh, what we've seen with BC Hydro is $15 billion in deferrals under this government due to bad deals that was foisted upon BC Hydro through legislation passed by this government. Legislation passed by this government that, uh, that forced BC Hydro to purchase power from independent producers at double, sometimes triple the rate, Honourable Speaker, that they can, uh, they can sell it at. So this has resulted in a, in a, huge, a huge debt for BC Hydro, $15 million in what's called deferrals, it's debt, $15 billion. So, you know, this results, when BC Hydro is forced under this government's legislation to buy power at sometimes double or even triple the rate that they can sell it at, it limits BC Hydro's options. They have to increase rates because of this government's legislation and this government's policy. We're in it together. Like so many other British Columbians, I know that international trade is vital, and it's vital to this province and all provinces. And with it comes the kind of econo economic diversity that can build real wealth, wealth and weather tough times. That same international trade is part of the reason we have the best economy in the country right now, a balanced budget and a creating rating that is the envy of the nation. Our total exports are now worth over $35 billion every year, an increase in more than 40 per cent since 2009. BC has had the worst wage growth in the country, the highest levels of household debt, and some of the highest levels of child poverty. It's not just massive increases on MSP payments, it's hydro, it's ICBC payments, tuition fees, tolls, ferry fares, even park fees. These are taxes. These are regressive taxes, and they're being, they're, they're being dismissed by the government as having no detrimental effect. Mr. Speaker, the um, Pacific Gateway Transportation Strategy 2012 to 2020 targets a further $25 billion in public and private sector investment in transportation infrastructure to meet rising demand from Asia for British Columbia and Canada's products. That's transportation, Mr. Speaker, and I know others have spoken of, but I will mention the $9.1 billion that has been spent by government on hospitals since 2001. $9.1 billion. And of course, in Vancouver, we are looking forward to the renewal of St. Paul's Hospital. $4.2 billion has been spent on schools since 2001. We are building the Surrey Courthouse. There are, is a proposal to have a look at the Abbotsford Courthouse. The people, Honourable Speaker, of Stikeen are place-based. They know that jobs and the environment are important, but we also know that the health of the people of the, economy, of the economy is inextricably linked to the health of the environment. There's people, many people, who depend on the salmon and the moose meat in the freezer and the salmon in jars as a way to feed themselves throughout the year. We're investing in Site C. I heard a, a few comments. Uh, with respect to Site C uh, in Northeast BC. Uh, Site C is underway, it's providing a lot of jobs for people and will provide uh, jobs for people for the next decade or more before it comes online. You know, that we're going to have uh, power to, uh, um, to provide power to our, our natural gas facilities in Northeast BC and our LNG facilities that we're gonna have on the coast of BC and we will have them contrary to a lot of the, the comments that I hear coming from across the floor desperate, absolutely desperate, to try to get one, not two, but one final investment decision. This government had an, a, a rare, unusual summer session for the sole purpose of legislating an agreement that ultimately amounted to a sellout of, the, of our resource, a desperate attempt 
to land and industry. One, in final investment deal. That deal was and remains environmentally reckless, fiscally foolhardy, and socially irresponsible. It is undoing all, it is undoing all of our climate leadership, as recently emphasized by a, a Canadian report on the environmental assessment in the area. Mr. Speaker, big ideas like Site C or LNG or well thought out pipelines that move BC and other provinces' resources to markets around the world are at the core of our province's future and our country's future. Big ideas, national ideas, are the stuff of legend, and more importantly, they are fundamental to the success of our province and country. Running parallel to the government's over the top statements on LNG was the continued advancement of the Site C Dam. The massive undertaking is clearly perhaps the clearest example of how irresponsible this government is with public resources. The whole reason, Honourable Speaker, for building Site C, as the Premier stated in 2013, was because it was needed, and I quote, for powering up the, these huge LNG facilities. Oops. What LNG facilities? Uh, and of course, Mr. Speaker, we are building again uh, uh, something not of, not of any interest to the members opposite. We are building the Site C Dam, a clean energy project to create extra energy. This project was originally priced at $6.6 billion in 2010, $7.9 billion in 2011, and as of 2014, the estimate was set at $8.8 .8 billion. Honourable Speaker, I bet I'm willing to stake a large bet today that it'll come in around $13 billion when all is said and done, and this will be an example of public subsidy for an industry that is not going to come to BC anytime soon. Treaty 8 chiefs, I guess, fighting to protect their territory, Honourable Speaker, from having it flooded, the territory that they've been in for millennia, Honourable Speaker. They've been standing against this government's decisions. In this case, in this one case, I've been up to Fort St. John a number of times recently. And, and uh, in my meetings, not just exclusively with Treaty 8, because there's many groups up there that are having some questions about the wisdom of this government's decision to flood 100 kilometers of some of the most valuable agricultural land left in the province and, of course, uh, massive amounts of territory that have been inhabited by these First Nations for millennia. Now we have with this apparent excess energy, whose production has crippled the clean energy sector in British Columbia, we hear that Site C may be helped to power Alberta. Well, there's a new idea and we'll put more public money subsidizing a transmission line to allow us to do so. To me, this sounds like a desperate attempt to savage, salvage a bad idea that anybody outside of government's inner circles would have realized was not timely and not cost-effective and irresponsible. A bad idea that happened to support another bad idea. Now, maybe get into this in a little more detail, but this is a decision that the government wouldn't even allow the independent body the BT, BC Utilities Commission to oversee. That's the job of the BC Utilities Commission. You do any government, does a major project, well, let's make sure it's in the best interests of the people of the province, the taxpayers of the province. Mr. Speaker, the um, Pacific Gateway Transportation Strategy 2012 to 2020 targets a further $25 billion in public and private sector investment in transportation infrastructure to meet rising demand from Asia for British Columbia and Canada's products. It's not just a, uh, it's not just a, a, a physical need that is fulfilled by a healthy environment. It's also economic. There's many people who are able to make a livelihood off those activities. And it's also spiritual in nature. You know, we're in the uh, season for those who are members of the Christian faith of Lent. And we know a story from Lent is that one cannot survive on bread alone, that there is a spiritual component to our lives as well. And that's exactly the way that people in Stikine who are place-based people understand their lives to be, that it's not simply uh, the economy, it's not simply bread, it's also the spiritual, the cultural nature of a healthy environment 
that sustains life where, where I live and where we live. It sustains life now, and it sustains the health, the spiritual, mental, physical, and cultural health of our children into the future. Mr. Speaker, and I know others have spoken of, but I will mention the $9.1 billion that has been spent by government on hospitals since 2001. $9.1 billion. And of course, in Vancouver, we are looking forward to the renewal of St. Paul's Hospital. And there are an incredible number of people still in need of a family doctor. In fact, fewer British Columbians, here's another statistic, fewer British Columbians have a regular doctor now than before the government made this loft, these lofty promises. Right now in British Columbia, it's estimated that over 200,000 people are still actively looking for a family doctor. When it comes to, in this case, MSP payments, so you've got a flat, you've got a flat tax that this government has increased what, it must seven, eight, nine, ten times. I've lost track now. It, it's a huge burden on families, tax-paying <coughs> families, um, and this is a cash cow for this government. We're not raising taxes. Well, you're not raising progressive taxes. You're increasing regressive taxes that hurts so many people in British Columbia and benefits the very few. Now, we should have such a debate in this House about tax policy, the difference between progressive and regressive taxation. Making life affordable and fair for British Columbians means MSP premiums need to be eliminated. Why is BC the only province that perpetuates a fundamentally unfair system to help pay our health care services? And under the BC Liberal government, MSP premiums have doubled since the Liberals came to power. Doubled. Other provinces have seen fit to take action to replace MSP with a far fairer way of paying for health care. We've doubled MSP premiums in this province under the BC Liberals. The Premier first says that she's going to tinker with it, she's going to tweak uh, MSP. Then the Premier is quoted today as saying, yes, it's antiquated, it's old, but it's really hard to try and make some sensible changes that we need to do. And at the very same time, we have the, hear the Finance Minister saying, that we need to keep the MSP so that people know that they're paying for health care. One of the most ridiculous arguments of all. First of all, the, health, the finance minister says, and he's right, $19 billion is the health budget. MSP is about $2.5 billion of that. So, you know, uh, the logic there, frankly, I think escapes British Columbians. So it's a regressive tax and it's completely unfair to charge someone making $30,000 a year the same amount as someone who is making $3 million a year, says Michelle, whose petition has almost 70,000 signatures on it. Again, again I, I see the government, so we're going to vilify those 70,000 people too for speaking out. $4.2 billion has been spent on schools since 2001. Andy Davidoff, who is the president of the Kootenai Columbia Teachers Association, is also a passionate advocate for education in our area. It's not just us talking about it. It's people that are saying that they need people, experts in the school system, who are saying that there needs to be a, a change in how the government funds education. He actually said that the, he called on the government to follow the recommendations of the Legislative Select Standing Committee on Finance and Government Services. And he said to me, isn't the majority of the people on that committee liberal MLAs, the Premier's MLAs? And the call was for BC to invest in public education so we can restore smaller classes and provide the right education and support to meet the unique strengths and challenges of each of our students. Each of our students, every one of our students in the school districts in this province need to have the support to make sure that they are successful. With 12 elementary schools and four secondary schools in my area, there are thousands of children being educated every day. With the rapid growth of the city, the school district has had to make adjustments after adjustments after adjustments with the sudden influx of school-aged children. In the last decade, we have seen the addition 
of more than 100 new portables to the district. If you just take the 7,000 students being taught in, out of portables in Surrey, they would amount to the 24th largest district in the province. 37 districts are smaller than the 7,000 students in portables. There are four high schools that are on staggered openings. They have two openings, two lunches, and two closings. It is a solution to crowding completely unique to Surrey. Uh, this government's lack of leadership, lack of plan to deal with overcrowding in our schools. Not only just the building, Mr. Speaker, but the very basics, they, they raise the issue of very basics that the students need for their daily education. Uh, uh, they have to raise money, they have to re fundraise uh, for the basics that the students, uh, you know, the needs of the students in, in those classrooms. Just be. Teachers are, are, are paying out of their own pockets so that the students can have the education that they need and deserve, Mr. Speaker. But this government is sitting quietly and they think everything is fine out there. Uh, that's not acceptable to people in Surrey, Mr. Speaker, and that shouldn't be acceptable to anybody, Mr. Speaker, regardless of which party you belong to, which side of this house you sit, because education is one area through which you can actually uh, decrease inequality in society. There's, a, there's also concerns in the Soyuz. They had over 1,000 people pack a gym the other night yeah. to say they don't want their school shut. Two schools are, being, are looking at being shut in the Soyuz, the secondary school as well as the elementary school. And both former Mayor Stu Wells and current Mayor Sue McCordoff spoke up in support of keeping these school, schools open. We had Michelle Nearing, president of the uh, Soyuz Secondary PACs, saying that how would the impact that the closure would have on the students and Brenda DeRosa, the chair of the Citizens Group Save Our Schools, or SOS, that delivered a well-researched presentation pointing to administrative savings the school district could make instead of closing schools. The district is the largest in the province and is constantly asked to do more with less. Well, fortunately, the schools in my, constitu my constituency of Surrey Green Timbers haven't felt that deep crush of overcrowding as badly as other areas in the city, the problem is still fe felt citywide. With the count of these portables now numbering 300, 300 portables in the district, and the approximately $4 million needed to service these temporary classrooms and make them fun functional, this puts a large dent in the yearly operating budget. Money that could be spent on teachers, on labs, on field trips, on classroom supplies, on the basics are being, are being used. The $4 million that could be used on these other things are being used to make sure these portables continue to be functional. And in my community of, of, um, of Vancouver Fraser View, I was so pleased to be joined by the Minister of Education recently when, when we were able to announce over $11 million for a seismic upgrade of Kingsford Smith Elementary School. And Mr. Speaker, I, I compliment the parents from that school for their advocacy for the project. They've been in to see me a number of times. They've gone to the school board a number of times. They were ready. So when the school board passed its facilities plan, they were ready to be first in line with the first announcement, Kingsford Smith Elementary School. I think the former mayor, Stu Wells himself, once a school trustee, put it best when he said the closing of schools shouldn't be left to the board, but instead the education minister and the premier should have to come to our community and explain why these schools should have to be closed. It's divisive, it's divisive politics at its worst. Divisive politics at its worst. This government makes cuts and then leaves the school boards Members. to clean up the mess. We have different views in this chamber about how we get to an outcome that is, uh, that is the best it can be for British Columbia. And on this side of the House, we, uh, we have had a plan that we have put in place and we have been absolutely driven over the last more than a decade to focus on our fiscal fundamentals, make sure that we have British Columbia um, 
uh, working as, as best we possibly can. And yes, Mr. Speaker, that has meant difficult decisions. It has certainly meant times where we couldn't say yes to every demand that people had. But it's so difficult to argue with the place that British Columbia finds itself in today. And while we could argue in this House about, you know, while we're, we're sixth in this and we're fifth in that and we're second in that, it's not just members on this side of the House that are saying how well British Columbia is doing. It's actually banks. It's actually uh, Stats Canada. It's actually people who actually have um, an interest in looking at factual and uh, third-party type information. So, for example, Madam Speaker, we've heard everybody on the other side being critical of the fact that um, British Columbia, uh, uh, where it stands in terms of leading the economy. We should be clear. British Columbia is expected to lead the economy in Canada both in 2016 and 2017. That doesn't happen by chance, and it's not something that people on this side of the House are just saying. That's exactly what economists across the country are saying, Mr. Speaker. We also uh, have heard in the throne speech uh, the vision of a balanced budget. But we have to dig a little deeper into that as well and look at how the choices were made to reach a balanced budget. I was uh, just recently at a meeting at Lake Kathleen Elementary School in uh, my constituency in Smithers. It was a packed auditorium. Hundreds of parents showed up. And that's because Lake Kathleen School is facing closure. The school district is, is uh, trying its hardest not to close the school, but they are faced with a mandate, a, uh, a edict from this government to come up with $380,000 in administrative savings over the next two years. $380,000 over the next two years. It's a small school district, and uh, the school administrators say that by closing Lake Kathleen, they can come up with $210,000 in administrative savings. So this is the government-mandated government mandated administrative savings plan that has been foisted on every school district in the province. So you can draw a direct line. You can draw a direct line between how this government has balanced a budget on the backs of children and families by closing schools. They've mandated to the school districts to come up with savings, administrative savings plan, and the school districts have had to say to parents, especially the parents of Lake Kathleen, by following the government's directive, we're going to uh, be faced with closing Lake Kathleen. So again, balanced budget, a laudable goal, a laudable effort. But when you look at the choices this government's made in order to come up with that balanced budget, the choices they've made is to balance that budget on the backs of children and families by closing schools.